do you know, we've come to the end of our eight week series, Love Each Other. I know, wow, we've done it. And whilst we've learned a lot about God's love toward us and the way we love others, its original aim was actually to bring our learnings right into a local context, into our local church, like for Voyage, to these people. Disciples of Jesus loving each other, just as Jesus taught his very first disciples. The main text for this series has been found in John chapter 13, where Jesus said, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You see, a Christian's life is one that is imprinted with the love and light of Jesus, proving to those outside of the church that Jesus is alive and his love is in his church. You could probably stay in this topic all year and still not discover the depths of what it means to live a life of love. But we certainly hope you haven't forgotten what's already been taught and that you remember it to put it into action and that you've actually already started to do that. Because the Bible says, do what God says, do what God's teaching says. Don't just listen and do nothing. When you only sit and listen, you are fooling yourselves. If you do what it says, you will have God's blessing. Never just listen to his teaching and forget what you have heard. So is there anything more important than love? I think we spend just far too much time, energy, money, chasing temporal, less important things. And God says, there is nothing more important than focusing and living a life of love. That is to live in his love and to share his love with each other. Let love be your highest goal. So to help us not quickly forget, to help us put into practice what we've been learning, I'm going to do a brief recap from each week of our series. And as I do, would you think about your attitudes and your actions toward the people in your church? And make notes as, as we go through this message today in the areas that you want to grow in. You can go back later and go to our YouTube channel and re-listen to the full messages and meditate on them. And what I'd like you to do is actually start to pray about the areas of growth and talk to others about it. And even today, after the service, discuss it together with those that you're gathered with joining us online. Even dare to ask. Ask others to pray for you. Keep you accountable as you practice, learn, and apply God's teachings. So, without further ado, week one, the definition of love. If we're gonna learn about loving each other, we first have to define what love is. There are many people divided and blinded about love, and it's actually become like a universal term that it really means nothing in particular. And it, it can make conversations about love really difficult because everyone is on a different page. Everyone has a different defini definition. You know, it doesn't help when the then president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, tweeted in 2013, hashtag love is love. I mean, what does love is love even mean? Come on. But we don't have to be confused about love. Because God has clearly demonstrated what real love is. And it's one that is unchanging and it's relative for every culture and every generation through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Hashtag love is not love. God is love. In week two, this message was called Made for Love. Now, have you ever taken the time to consider that all of your pursuits, all of your cravings, they come from one place, one need, and that's to experience real love? 
And that's because you've been created by God who is love. So you've been created by God to be loved by him and for you to love others. But here's the thing. You cannot give what you don't already have. And God wants to have a personal relationship with you so that you can experience his love in your heart and to give you the power, the ability to love others because you've experienced this amazing love. Otherwise, all of your efforts and and human love, it'll fall short because you cannot give what you don't already have. But all is not lost when it comes to love. Real love is not far from your reach. If you dare, dare to open your heart to God, the one who made you by love and for love, well then his love will radically and supernaturally bring change into your life and into your relationships. In receiving and believing in God's son, Jesus Christ, you will possess a love that empowers you to live a life of love. You will be able to give what you have already received. And to know more about a love that's come down to you, listen to this message in week two of this series called Made for Love. Or share it with those in your world who haven't yet experienced the love of Jesus. It may just be the answer they're looking for. Week three was love the ones you're with. We profiled some of the disciples and it was like putting you know, flesh and skin on them, like just taking them off the page, no longer just a name, but they, be- they became real humans with personal stories from various backgrounds and including rivalries and jealousy and conflicting ambitions with one another. Many of them didn't have a lot in common and they were all following Jesus for different reasons. And it was to these people that Jesus first gave the new command to love each other just as he loved them. Now, not much has changed with followers of Jesus today in local churches everywhere. Churches are filled with very different people, different personalities and backgrounds and social standings different personal interests. And yet Jesus's command to love the ones you're with remains unchanged. You are to love the people in your church just as Jesus loves you. In fact, it's God's design that his church is filled with different people so that In the middle of our diversity, his followers experience his love and that the world would see his love operating in our diversity. That the world would look in and go, they're all so different, but they've got this crazy love. That we love despite our differences. And this is the power of God's love on display to those outside of the church. We have missional impact when the world sees you love the ones you're with who are nothing like you at all. And this begins by praying just as Jesus prayed. You see, when we pray for each other by name, we can ask God, God, give me a heart for those you've put me in community with. Oh, Lord, I want your heart. Increase my love. Have you been praying, praying to God to give you his heart for each other, for others in your church? Let's pray for one another. Pray unceasingly, never forgetting, never giving up. And week four was dirty feet. In the first century, people traversed dusty, dirty roads littered with all kinds of refuse and filth And the common footwear was sandals, which meant most people's feet got really dirty, really stinky, ugly, dirty, stinky feet. It was customary upon entering a home that the lowest of all slaves or servants would wash a person's filthy feet. 
It was necessary because it was, they were just so filthy, but it was also humiliating. It was a humble task for the foot washer. It wasn't a pleasant job at all. And even though today we have sealed roads, relatively clean streets, and we wear covered shoes, well, every person still has dirty feet because it's a metaphor. And in this message, we see God himself taking on the role of a servant to wash our dirty feet. And then he says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Now you do the same. In other words, roll up, roll up your sleeves, bend down, get low, get humble with one another. Be forgiving and, and cover each other's weaknesses and wash each other's dirty feet. You see, we all have dirty feet because we live with the consequences of our past sins, our families of origin. We all accumulate dirt from the dusty roads and the distractions of traversing this sin-stained world. So our feet, they need regular washing in the forgiveness of Jesus and in the forgiveness of each other. And Jesus said, you do as I have given you this example. You are to take on the humble role of a servant, just as Jesus has for you. Week five, the big reveal. You know, unfortunately, many Christians, they're seeing the church community as optional. They organize their life around everything else. They leave that, you know, it's kind of in the middle or towards the end because they're organizing their life around work rosters and family events, sport, the surf conditions, or they go to bed late and, you know, or they just have a couldn't be bothered attitude some days. It's really sad because the real problem here is a lack of understanding on what the good news of Jesus is actually all about. The gospel is not about just you and Jesus. The gospel message, the big reveal shown to us in the book of Ephesians is all about Jesus and his church. Jesus came for his church. Jesus loves his church. Jesus died for his church. And Jesus is returning for his church. The church is not a human institution. Even though it's filled with faults and failures, it's not a human institution creation it's a divine eternal creation and even though this next statement might be hard to swallow it's true if you're outside of the church you're outside of the purposes of Christ because it's in the church where God speaks acts and fills everything with his presence so don't underestimate the gospel of Jesus and his church, don't underestimate the ministry of turning up. Every time you turn up and participate, you're saying God is important to me and you are important to me and I wouldn't dream of missing this. Week six, tear down, build up, grow up. You know, following on from the big story, the big reveal of Jesus and his church, well, this shapes every part of our life story. Jesus tore down the dividing walls of hostility between people in his flesh on the cross to reconcile us to God and to each other. He brought peace and he created a unity to make us one. And now those in his church maintain his peace and unity. So we tear down and tearing down is about looking in, inside yourself, keeping a check of your attitudes, beliefs and stories that you tell about yourself and others that would build walls to divide and separate you. We looked at building up, which is, a, which is about looking out, looking out to others, using your words in new ways, not swearing and you know, dirty talk anymore, but bringing hope and life through the words of encouragement that you speak to one another, that you pray for one another, that you read scripture to one another, you sing songs to one another. 
It's actually repurposing our language and speaking the truth of God's word to each other throughout the week. How are you going with that? Have you remembered each week to build up one another with those words? Get on the phone, send a text message, an email. Let's do this. Have a coffee with someone. Zoom someone. We can do it. And to grow up. And grow up is about looking up to Jesus. You see, it's in the heat of the kitchen found in community. The community of his church where God is giving you opportunities for the life of Jesus to mature in you and to be formed in you. Oh, excuse me, can I get a refill, please? Coming right up. Thank you. Excuse me, are you all right? Yeah. No, it's a long story. Well, I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. My husband, have you heard of New York's Noah? <laughs> the guy who's building the ark. That's him. I love that story. No one in the ark. You know, a lot of people miss the point of that story. They think it's about God's wrath and anger. They love it when God gets angry. What is the story about then, the ark? Well, I think it's a love story about believing in each other. You know, the animals showed up in pairs. Mm -hmm. you know, they stood by each other, side by side, just like Noah and his family. Everybody entered the ark side by side. But my husband says, God told him to do it. What do you do with that? Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage? Or does he give them opportunity to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? <laughs> well, I gotta run. A lot of people to serve. Enjoy. The church is where you grow. Don't run. Don't run away when things get hot or hard, or sometimes boring in the kitchen. Stick it out and reap the benefits of personal change and new life, not only in you, but in those that you're in community with. Week seven, who's my partner? Oh, the fellowship that Christians share together is not a cup of tea after the service, a church picnic, it's not even a pleasant evening of Bible study. I know, right? Well, what is it then? The fellowship that we have with each other goes far deeper. The Greek word in the New Testament often used is koinonia. I can't even speak Greek. I don't know how to say it. Koinonia. It actually means partnership. Partnership. Fellowship means partnership. It also means participation contributing and sharing. As disciples of Jesus, we all share in God's grace together. And in sharing this, it makes us partners in the gospel. The picture for fellowship and partnership is of, of one locking arms and striving together for the faith of the gospel, not being surprised when conflict and struggle might come. We follow Jesus together, like arm in arm. I, I don't know how to do arm in arm when I'm just one. Standing for Jesus together, side by side, as a united army, fighting for our King. We're citizens of heaven. We're partners in suffering. And we're partners in victory. You see, when one weeps, we all weep. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. What happens to you affects me. And what happens to me? Well, I hope it affects you because of our partnership, because of our love, because of our shared life. Is that how you view each other? 
partners, deep in fellowship, sharers together of God's grace. Surprisingly, this fellowship and partnership, it's the normal Christian life. The normal. And it sounds like I'm preaching something new. The Bible describes it as normal. It it describes the church community as people who are willing to put their lives on the line for each other. Oh man, I'm challenged by that and I'm one of your shepherds. Would I lay down my life? For the sheep, would you lay down your life for each other? Fellowship is partnership. It's not a cup of tea after the church service. And finally, week eight. Don't stop the flow. Surely you haven't forgotten this one from last Sunday. Faith in what Jesus has done for you at the cross means that God has forgiven all of your past sins, your present current sins, and even the sins that you're going to commit in the future. I mean, that's just mind-boggling, isn't it? God has given you countless second chances at the cross, all because of his love. The question then to ask is, do you give others countless second chances? You've been forgiven far more than you will ever forgive others in your entire lifetime. In other words, God has forgiven your debt that was worth millions so that you can freely give the debt of others that's only worth hundreds. Don't stop the flow. Freely you have received this grace and this mercy and this love from God. Now freely give. What have you received? Love, mercy, Grace, patience, kindness, generosity. You see, God's love has come down to you where you are at. So love each other in the same way. Oh, a love that comes down to each other. A love that imagines and believes for greater things in each other. Don't stop the flow by presuming and predicting your brother's or sister's outcomes. Rather, every morning is a day of new mercies, new possibilities and new outcomes for each other. Look at each person. Pray for each person. Imagine and believe for greater for each person, just as Jesus imagines and believes for greater in and through you. It's so epic. You know, so much of this series has touched on each of our four epic voyage values. Think about all that we've recapped and see it in our epic values, E-P-I-C. The first one is E for experiencing. Experiencing bold, loving relationships with God and one another. This speaks of encounters and devotion. P, participating together as contributors, not consumers. We are church, speaks of generosity and identity. I, imagining and believing for greater, speaks of creativity, faith and innovation. And C, communicating the message of Jesus, making disciples as we live to worship him, speaks of hope and transformation. You know, when we do what we value, we create culture. These values will be what we all experience and what we will become known for. How exciting is that? It's actually within our reach. It's in our grasp if we commit to living out our values. So in closing, Jesus said, I want to leave you with his words, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Christian pastor and author Peter Scazzaro explains the process and context of being a disciple of Jesus like this. He says, when you come to faith in Christ, you're born again into this new family. That is the good news of the gospel. However, discipleship 
is that growth process of leaving your family of origin and your culture and your old values and learning to be a follower of Jesus in his new family. Your discipleship happens in the church, in community with other believers, and it never ends. But know this, new growth and new life comes after death. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And Jesus was talking about himself, but the principle is true for all of us. Here are some intermingled thoughts between myself and author Nathan Finocchio from his book, Hearing from God. Sometimes relationships in the church, well, they actually feel as though you're being buried alive and slowly dying. And that's because that's exactly what's happening. You're being suffocated. You have no space. Your patience is being tested. The level of your love and grace is being exposed. But you'll have the opportunity to learn to respond correctly if you don't run out of the kitchen. It's when you endure the heat and eventually the annoying selfish part of you, well, it will be dead and buried with Jesus. And a new life, a new you will be raised in power. Your closest community, your church, you've got to allow them to play a role in your spiritual life, to get a little bit vulnerable. And if you play it rightly, if you play it with humility and sincerity and authenticity and you're willing to learn and grow, oh my goodness, it's an invaluable one. If you allow other Christians to hold up a mirror, I know it hurts, right? But to help you face, you know, the things in your life and to help you see what you truly look like, it's actually a gift. You become increasingly aware of your true condition. And it's in that place that God speaks in community and he speaks in his word and his word comes alive and his word, it wounds us just like sometimes community does. But the scriptures are faithful, even though they can wound us with the truth, they heal us and so does community. There's a wisdom that exists in external voices, not just the ones in your own head, justifying your behavior. It's time, to, it's time to die to the old and be born again and raised up into the new. When those external voices are godly and when they love you, oh, they ought to be considered, weighed heavily because this is discipleship. This is the process of learning to be a follower of Jesus in his new family. Let love be our highest goal. 